Good morning and welcome to church on a beautiful wintry morning. <laughs> so this feels more like January than um, November, but uh, this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to everyone. Um, if you're worshiping with us online, a warm welcome to you also and to those who are all here um, physically in church this morning, a wonderful and warm welcome to everyone and a special welcome to Beth Pellinger who will bring God's message to us this morning. May we all be blessed through uh, the reading of God's word and listening to what he has to say to us again for this coming week. I have a couple of announcements and from the uh, Refugee Committee, we have a special uh, collection this morning for our Ukrainian family and there will be two deacons with um, collection bags standing at the doors after church if you um, are able to um, give to that cause then they will be there to uh, receive your money. Um, also a reminder that next Sunday after church we have our um, fall uh, membership meeting and um, there are copies of the uh, the agenda and the budget on the back table if you haven't received one through email or not able to do that so you can pick up a copy there and study it and look at it this week that's all the announcements I have for this morning and may we be may God be praised and blessed through our worship today could you rise with us in body and spirit our call to worship. Welcome to a time of wonder and music that calls us home. Welcome to hear God's words that inspire and challenge and to reminders that we are offered holy hospitality. Hospitality that teaches us how to open our lives to others, leading us to fully live open minds, open hearts, open doors. Your voice, your hearts adore. 
were supposed to sing this before the call to worship, so we will now sing Crown Him with Many Crowns right after this. Sorry. Good morning. It's wonderful to be with you this morning. To those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours, so grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. We will sing, you may be seated. We will sing uh, This is the Light of Mine. And see there's not very many children. We'll just let the children sit and come on us and we'll sing this is the light of mine before they get dismissed for Sunday school. This little light of
May we pray together. Merciful God of compassion and justice, have mercy on us as we confess our sin. We are not the stewards Christ calls us to be. Riches possess us while others go hungry. We mismanage creation with our pollution and strife to obtain ever more than we already have. We abuse your provision for us by our selfish natures. Help us hear again Christ's call to be faithful and through him forgive us as we repent of our sin and turn from it. Loving God, the widow of Zarephath with a handful of flour and a drop of oil fed the prophet Elijah before her child and herself. God teach us the joy of hospitality which welcomes friend and stranger, neighbor and enemy, and so finds you feasting among us. God of abundance, the widow of Jerusalem with two small coins offered to you her love, her worship, and all she had. Teach us the joy of giving freely, which counts nothing as ours by right, but willingly shares and so finds you sharing with us. God of resurrection, Christ Jesus, with his whole being sacrificed himself for the sake of your love for us. Teach us the joy of giving ourselves to you so that we yearn for your presence, long for your salvation, and so find you living in us. God of mercy, it is ever your will that we love and work and pray for those who are in need of bread and of shelter, of healing and of wholeness. Hear the prayers we make for those of our world, those of our community, and those of our family who are in need. We lift before you now in the silence of our hearts and with the words of our lips. Bless, we pray, O oh God, your church throughout the world and help it to fulfill the purpose you have given it. Especially, we pray for our own congregation. Guide us each day and help us to give as completely as we have received. We ask it in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, our brother and our friend. Amen. Could you rise with us? What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong. Who holds our days within His hand? What comes apart from His command? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ.
Let's come to God in prayer. We praise and thank you, O Lord, that we can come to your house to worship you in freedom, that we can bring our praises to you, the creator of all things, and that we can hear the faithful preaching of your holy word. We offer to you our prayers for all people. God of compassion, we remember before you the poor and the afflicted, the sick and the dying, all who are lonely, the victims of war, injustice, and inhumanity. We pray specifically for those in our congregation that are suffering from physical, emotional, and spiritual ailments. Bring healing to each of them. We pray for those who are mourning the recent loss of loved ones. Sustain them through the loneliness as they grieve. Our thoughts and prayers are with Klaus and his family, as well as Rose and her family, as they have so recently experienced the loss of a spouse. We also lift up Rick and Alita and extended family with the loss of Rick's father earlier this month. We bring before you those who are ill in our church family. We pray for restoration of health for Sherp, as well as peace for Edna and the family as they continue to care for Sherp and his needs. We continue to pray for healing for Marg as she recovers from her her cancer. Many are suffering from colds, flus, and respiratory illnesses, and we ask for healing on each and every one of them. Be with our health care workers as they feel the stress of their work with increased patient care. We pray for the people of Ukraine, Ethiopia, and Somalia, where conflict continues. We pray for all those who are displaced because of war. Help them as they try to restore their lives. We are thankful that the Salva family have been able to resettle in Ingersoll and that they have been a blessing to our congregation and that we have been a blessing to them. O Lord of Providence, you hold the destiny of the nations in your hands. We pray for all countries that you inspire the hearts and minds of the leaders, that all nations may seek first your kingdom and righteousness so that order, liberty, and peace may dwell with your people. Take away the mistrust and lack of understanding that causes division between peoples. We pray for our government, elected officials, and civil servants. Help them to make wise and just decisions that they may act in accordance with your will. We pray that the laws that are made are fair and just for all and are for the benefit of all society. O Savior God, look upon your church and its struggles on this earth. In a world where Christianity is attacked from all sides, sustain your people. We pray for Covenant Church. The future of this church is in your hands. Increase our faith, give us courage, and inspire us to be a witness to all people. Bless all of the leaders of this church, the ministry and support staff, and all those who volunteer to continue the ministries of this church week after week. We ask for your blessing upon Pastor Beth as she delivers the message from your word, and we ask for your blessing upon the reading of your word. In your name we pray, amen.
Our reading this morning is from 1 Kings 17, verses 7 to 16. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what, you have, from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, the jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. This is the word of the Lord. I have to tell you, before I start this morning, as you were singing this little light of mine, I remember when I was like 16, which was like two years ago, uh, <clears throat> maybe, an experience. And uh, we had this group that we sang, and there were nine of us in the group, and it was called Sounds of Liberation. And we all wore the same outfits, and we looked pretty cool in the 70s doing that. Um, and I remember we were going to sing This Little Light of Mine in church on a Sunday night, but it was going to be a rocking version of This Little Light of Mine. And I just remember all these older ladies in the front of the church, I thought they were all going to have a heart attack as we were just like unfolding this thing and having the best time of our life. So every time I hear that song, I think of that moment. And I remember as a teenager thinking, I think I just saw three chins become four. Um, just because they were just so shocked, but then they fell in love with it too and joined in and it was good. Um, I want you to imagine with me, um, I know that we live in a world where homelessness and where poverty really are beyond what we could imagine. I don't think any of us ever dreamt that it could be at this stage. And there are days that I watch people walk up and down uh, the streets. <clears throat> and I've done a couple of funerals this summer um, of people who lived on the street, one from a fentanyl overdose, um, and one just because when you're on the street, your health deteriorates in a different way. And, um, and it's hard. Um, and part of this story that we just read is involved in that. So I want you to imagine for a minute what it would be like. Um, we just saw little ones walk out. So you have a little son that age. You're a single mom. You're a widow. You've already lost your husband um, for whatever reason. And it's already hard enough to just put things together. But can you picture with me what it must be like for her to stand in front of her son, knowing that there's not gonna be anything left in the cupboard? There's enough for one meal, and she can't take care of him anymore. And she's watching him as they have just been meeting and out little by little. And she's looking at her son, wanting to do everything she can. And her heart is broken. I can't imagine looking at my kids and saying, I don't know how I'm gonna feed you today. I can't imagine looking at my grandkids who raid my cupboards on a regular basis and them going to my cupboard and having nothing there. 
And I don't know what this widow would have done other than she knew she was going to go get some sticks. And so she left her son behind and she was walking out to get some sticks. There was no hope left. It's a pretty bleak situation. I would never want to explain to my kid, this is the moment. I even wonder if in her words or her thoughts, she thought, I hope he dies first so that he is not left alone. If I die first, then what happens to him? Um, and so she goes out and she's collecting sticks and that happens to be the moment that Elijah shows up. <clears throat> now I want you to picture with me Elijah. Um, the world has gone into chaos. Ahab has messed up the system and is worshiping everything but God. And God says to Elijah, there's going to be a famine. There's going to be a drought. You're going to pray, and this is going to happen. Um, and in the process of this, I want to, you know, give you a little bit. So I'm going to give you a new place to live. You're not going to stay where you normally do. I'm going to send you to a river. Sounds like a lovely place to live beside a river. If you've ever seen any of the tent cities anywhere, you will know it's not really fun to live beside a river. And, um, and God says, Elijah, I want you to go live beside this river. And, um, and I'm going to get a raven to come and feed you morning and night. This raven is going to bring you bread and meat, um, and you can drink from the river. Now, I don't know about you, but did you realize that a raven is an unclean animal? <laughs> it's not one of the things that, you know, we would put in our church order that says, yes, ravens can feed you. In fact, it would probably say, stay far, far away from ravens. And yet God says, it's the ravens who are going to feed you. Something that's out of your comfort zone is going to come along and give you bread and meat every day. And, um, and I don't know what Elijah was thinking at that moment. It was like, God, seriously, this is where you want me to go? Um, I know this is a really tough time, but seriously, a river and a raven... But because you said so, I will trust you. I will trust you whatever you ask me to do in the process. Now, let me just explain to you for one minute. How many of you have been at the beach? And you've had a picnic lunch there. And your blanket is out. And your fried chicken is out. And everything is perfect. And then these three teenagers that are on the beach just slightly down from you on this very windy day decide it's time for them to go home and they pick up their towels and they do this, what happens to your chicken? Um, are you blessed in that moment? <laughs> well, I think that's kind of how Elijah felt. This is because of Ahab's sin, but I'm being affected by it. And I don't particularly like it, but God, I'm going to trust you in the middle of this. And so... Ahab goes and lives by the river. And then it gets even better because the river dries up. Okay, God, you're sure this is where you sent me, right? Because you're going to provide everything I need and you're going to give me all the resources I need and it's going to be amazing. Yet, no, the river dries up and it gets worse. And then he says, okay, I want you to go to a totally different culture I want you to go where all the people are worshiping Baal. Um, I want you to go out of your comfort zone one more time, and I want you to find a widow, because she's going to feed you. Now, I have a feeling that Elijah at that moment was like, oh, this must be a really good widow. She must be doing really well if she's going to feed me. And um, he starts walking, and then as he's walking down the road, he sees this woman bent over picking up sticks and God kind of whispers, this is the one. And so he says, uh, can I have a glass of water? And she was like, uh, okay. I'm not sure who you are, but I can give you a glass of water. Um, and then he said, how about a piece of bread too? You don't mind making me a little cake or a piece of bread uh, to go with that water? Now, I don't know what that woman was thinking at that moment. The sand towels just erupted. I have enough for my son and I. And a total stranger shows up and says, 
will you feed me? Now, she has no Christian background, and if you notice in the story, it says, by your God. So she recognizes where he's coming from, but it's your God. It's not my God. So she doesn't have this moment of saying, I know that God's going to be faithful and do everything. <clears throat> and she says, I don't have it. I'm gathering these sticks. My son and I are going to eat one last meal, and we're going to die. Now, two things have to go through Elijah's moment, his head at that moment. One is, seriously, God, I have nothing, and you're sending me to the person who has next to nothing? Really, this is how this works? Uh, could you feed me with the banquet over here? Because that would look a whole lot nicer. Um, so, God, are you sure? And then he, because Elijah knows the power of God and the faithfulness of God, he says, I'm going to trust you. So he asks the woman for bread. And then Elijah does something even crazier because she said, we're about to die. We don't have anything. And he goes, oh, so um, could you get me the water? And before you have that last meal with your son, could you still bring me the piece of bread? Isn't that a little bit arrogant? <laughs> it's like, I want to slap you at this moment. Um, and, but there's something amazing about this story, or it must be about the composure of Elijah that he's trusting God in this story, that this woman goes, okay, I will trust you with what you say, even though I don't know you. And so the woman goes back and she gives him water and she makes a cake. And I don't know what it felt like when you picked up that jar of oil and it was really empty and she pours it into the bowl and she reaches in with her hand to the very little meal that's left and she stirs that and she knows there's enough for one cake there. And it's gonna cost her her son's life. It's gonna cost her everything. But she gives this cake to Elijah. And Elijah eats that cake and he looks at her and nods. He said, like, go ahead. And she reaches back to the jar of oil, just a glimmer of hope that maybe something that this man has said is true. And as she picks it up, it's heavy. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? You knew that jar was empty, and the next thing, there's oil being poured into the pan again. And she reaches in for the meal, and the same thing happens, and a handful comes out. And for three and a half years, there is enough oil in that jar and enough meal in that basket to feed them all until it rains again. Three and a half years of feeling this drought and not understanding and knowing that life is tough. I talked to a pastor from Kenya yesterday um, and the drought in Kenya is so bad and people are dying, and animals are dying. And he said, please, continue to pray for rain for us. They know what that story looks like when there's nothing. So that story may be very old in the Bible, but it still happens today for people. So the question of that story then, of the, the providence of God and the resources of God, are they still true in 2022? Moving into 2023, what do we have, about seven weeks left? Less, and what's this, five weeks until Christmas Day? And then one week, so six weeks left in 2023 is upon us. Is God still the faithful God that he was for Elijah and the widow? We've gone through a major three and a half, or I don't know how many years now, uh, it just feels like a really, really long time of disruption and sickness and being apart and all kinds of things and churches feeling really um, out of sorts, maybe, is a good phrase. And yet there's God in the middle of it saying, <laughs> maybe you feel like you've got nothing but I want to send you to the one who has next to nothing so that maybe together you will share a meal. 
and you will begin to see the providence of God beginning to erupt. Now, one of the questions I get asked on a regular basis is, um, how come people aren't coming back to church the way that it used to? I'm thankful for all of you here, but there's a lot of people who are sitting at home. And I have to admit, sometimes sitting at home with a cup of coffee in my pajamas watching a service is a really awesome thing because it kind of feels like a Sabbath. <laughs> um, Sabbath doesn't happen on Sunday, usually in my world. It's usually a different day of the week. And so I know that the temptation can be to stay at home or not to connect. Um, but I was processing something and I was reading an article that I think might be an important thing for each of us to know, especially in light of this story. So a lot of pastors are saying, you know, we're giving it all and yet people just aren't coming back and we don't understand and we're, we're living in the middle of that story where it feels like there's a little bit of oil and a little bit of green. When I was younger, and um, some of you are old enough to um, play into this story. Some of you have no clue what I'm about to say, but it's okay. You'll get it. Um, so like in, in the 1960s, um, yes, and I was alive and well and doing great things. Um, Saturday night, hockey night in Canada. It wasn't every night of the week. You got one hockey game a week, and then you watched the Beverly Hillbillies, and you had popcorn, and you went to bed because church was going to happen in the morning. And there was only three channels on TV, and um, everybody was watching exactly the same show at the same time, and that's all you got. There was nothing else. Um, and if you happened to be at your grandmother's, you missed the hockey game, and you missed Beverly Hillbillies. And there was no way you could get that episode back unless there was reruns three years later. Then the 70s happened, and we all got these little squares that were called VCRs. And all of a sudden, we could tape the show and record it. And we were like, this is cool. Now I can watch this. Now we're in the 2000s, and PBR is our life. So we can watch anything, anytime we want, and we can watch everything we want. Do you know what that means, though, is that Sunday mornings are not sacred anymore. Sermons are not sacred anymore, because I can watch them on YouTube at midnight. And I can watch them at 8 o'clock in the morning when I'm having my breakfast. And I can watch any preacher I want, good or bad. Um, which does this comparison game really bad for the guy who's on the ground. Um, but it means that in our brains over the last three years, what we have done is we've translated into a PVR reality, and we don't live in reality anymore. We don't live in present time because we can do life whenever we want at any time of the day or night, and that affects church because it's not sacred anymore. What is still sacred and where you have to show up if you want anything is a meal. <laughs> if you want to eat, you got to do it in real time. You can't PVR. You can PVR the cooking show, but you cannot eat in any other time but real time. Um, it's either in cooking and food or a concert. But you can even get a concert on TV now or on your VCR or on your computer or your iPad, or however else you want to watch it. But something about food shows up that you can't play with that. And so the one thing I know about food, and I know about this story, and probably part of your story as you um, engage with this Ukrainian family, this is about generous hospitality, which I think is what Jesus is always all about. This widow showed generous hospitality to Elijah. She was willing to give what she had, regardless of the consequences of not knowing whether that jar would ever fill up or not. She was willing to give it because she was going to trust the one who said he trusted in God. What does that do in our world? Sometimes as churches, it's really easy to get caught up in what we don't have at the moment. Perhaps this is a new challenge to look at what we do have. 
And for every person, we have a heart of Jesus living inside of us, and we know the one who gave his life for us, that's generous hospitality. Grace is at the top of generosity. He knew it would cost him everything, knowing what we would do and be and look like, and he still said, I love you enough and it's worth it that I'm gonna give everything so that you would have an opportunity to share that same hospitality, that same grace with others. So when God puts a church in a community, there's a reason. It's not just because it's a sweet building on a street. It's about the congregation inside. It's about those of you who are here. God says, this is your season. Now, I can pretty safely say to most of you, I think to all of you, that none of you were alive in 1832. And can almost guarantee that none of you were alive in 1902. But as I get up, there might be a couple that I get a little close to, but I'm pretty sure that all of you are here in 2022. So what is it about your gift? What is it that's in your jar that God said, I need you in this season? What is it about you that God said you're so important that I know this pandemic is gonna happen and life is gonna get crazy and the world's gonna be turned upside down, but your gift that I've given you and how you've been created is perfect for my plan in 2022. Does that do anything to you? Can you trust him with that? Can you trust him as you hold your very small container of oil and your handful of grain and he says, share it? Can you trust him? Can you pour it out and start mixing it up knowing that someone from outside of what you're comfortable with is going to show up? The world is changing. 12 years ago when we moved into our neighborhood in St. Thomas, it was a very white neighborhood. That is not the case. There has been enough sales of houses and people moving and shifting that I can just about put um, almost anybody in my neighborhood now. Trinidad is across the street. Africa's down the corner. Pakistan is three doors down. Like, it has changed our neighborhood, it's awesome. It's wonderful and we get to meet our neighbors and hang out with them and hear incredible stories of their journeys as well. I remember one lady who came to our picnic table one day and she just said, the world is a mess. And I said, yes, and she said, and all the religions in the world are in a mess right now too. Maybe we should learn from one another. And I was like, she's very accurate. What do I need to learn from my neighbors and what do I need to do to create new space so that the generous hospitality of God shows up over and over again and the faithfulness of God is seen in the people of God. I wonder what God thinks when we kind of go, oh God, we don't have enough for anything. What should we do with that? And he's looking at you going, you have my son and you have me, what more do you need? <laughs> um, could you trust me with what I wanna do in your life? Could you trust me with the story to erupt it and open it up and begin to see amazing things that I have planned for you? I'm kind of excited to see what 2023 looks like. In Resonate, one of the things that happened and a couple of people from here were actually there on Labor Day weekend and we held this diaspora uh, weekend. And I think there were maybe eight or nine of us who would have been white Euro ethnic background. Got a little freaky when it was an Igor Kim and I realized that we had Russian Koreans and then there was Pablo Kim and we had Spanish Koreans and then we had people from Cambodia and we had people from Nepal and we're working on a church in London right now that will probably be a church plant out of one of our plants that will be a Nepalese church. 
And um, Bim and Prim are like an amazing couple in hearing their story of how they came to Canada. And it's awesome to see. And we realize that one of the things, maybe of a Dutch background and understanding that immigration and, and the refugee status that many of your families have in your history, is that God is doing it again, just with a different group of people. And so you already understand and have this context of what's it like to be generous or to share with one another. And God is saying, it's time to do it again. And so we've been looking at what's the capacity of CRC as we see the immigrants. One of the best stories that I heard, though, was about someone who wanted to be in Tibet. But to be a Christian in Tibet or to share the news of Jesus in Tibet is worthy of death. But did you know that in Toronto, there are more, that's the largest number of Tibetans outside of Tibet is in Toronto. And there's no law that says I can't share my faith with someone from Tibet in Toronto. God has gifted Canada with immigrants and refugees from countries where it would not be possible for them to hear the gospel. And yet here, right close to us, we have that opportunity. And we begin to see it everywhere. It's not just in Toronto, it's in every city across Canada. God is up to something. And I don't know whether he's saying, like I'm not gonna say that it's the raven, so to speak, but in our mind sometimes, the other is the uncomfortable piece. And yet God says, I'm gonna bring the raven to feed you to Elijah. Who does God want to bring to you in Woodstock that's going to feed you that just blows your mind because you couldn't have imagined it before? What does the story look like as God just unfolds his mercy and grace in very cool ways? I guess maybe it's time for us to maybe all take a moment to imagine what do we have? And what is God calling us to? And how does he want to bring community back together in a way that um, it hasn't been in the last few years? Maybe this is a time for each of us to do an assessment about our trust level. What's your river? Is it illness? Is it sickness? Is it your family dynamics? Is it your job? What is it that is that thing that God has said, I put you in this space because I wanna teach you something about trust. And I wanna teach you that I'm still faithful in those moments. And then as you learn those lessons, he says, now I'm gonna take you and send you again. I mean, I'm reminded of Luke 10. It's one of those irritating passages of scripture. God says, go into your community and have a good time, but don't take anything with you. Don't make any plans. Don't worry about your pocketbook. Don't even take a toothbrush with you. Just go and hang out and find people of peace and love on each other and see where God shows up. But God, we have a program and we know how this works through a program. Um, I don't care about a program, you don't need it. Go talk to someone. But God, this is the way we do it. Don't you understand? We put this in place. You're gonna irritate me if you make me move out of that comfort zone. How many times did Jesus heal on a Sabbath? I'm sure it was to irritate the church leaders, to make them think outside of the box that they're so used to. And he just says, go into your community and learn. And 70 people go into the community totally unprepared other than they knew the story of good news. And what's amazing is Jesus says, as you go out, the kingdom of God will come near. Do you know why the kingdom of God comes near? It's because they went into the community, because they are the kingdom of God. Each of you is represented as a person in the kingdom of God. And when you show up, so does Jesus. This week, I got a very interesting text um, from a friend in London. And she said, can I send you a grade 10 homework question? 
for her grandson. <laughs> I was like, okay. I, I hope it's not math or science or history because then I'm done. Um, but if it's an English question, I'll be okay. Um, her son goes to a Catholic school. Her grandson goes to a Catholic school. So the question is, um, there are three questions. What is your, um, what are the challenges in your life? What are your weaknesses? What are your strengths? And where do you see God in the middle of your strengths? Perfect high school questions, right? And he, she said, he doesn't know how to answer the one about finding God in the middle of my strengths. And she said, is there a chance you could answer that or help him answer that question? And I was like, oh, this is a fun question. Um, and I said, okay, um, God created to be you to be who you are, so what are the things that you are passionate about? What are the things that you really like to do? What's there? And I said, for instance, now my son is 38, um, but he was an avid basketball player and he was a point guard. And so his gift is to be able to see the whole court. Right? The point guard is going to bring that ball up, but he's got to be looking for the forwards and everybody else to know where he's going to dish the ball off. And if he does a good job of it, they score. Um, if he's not seeing the whole court, it ends up at the other end of the court. Um, but I said, he's played basketball for a long time, and now his body at 38 says, you shouldn't play so often. Um, even though he still wants to. But I said, what's amazing is um, he got to coach this year for the high school that he went to um, for the girls' senior basketball team, which means he still has the gift to see the whole court, and he knows how to build team, and he knows how to push people into places. So as a leader, he pushes from behind to make sure you're in the right position. I said, those are the gifts from God. So what is it about your gifts? Because when you use the things that are good about you, then you're living into the person that God created you to be. What a challenge for each of us. How has God created you? What has he given you as your gifts? And are you using them so that other people can see God through your story? Spiritual gifts are not meant to be badges on your arm. They're meant to be practiced so that other people will say, you're a good teacher, or you're a good leader, or you're an intercessor, or you're someone who's incredibly generous because of your actions. When the widow gave everything, in her actions she said, this story is big enough that I'm gonna trust it. And for three and a half years, they ate and fed until the rain returned, and they didn't need that kind of provision anymore. I want to challenge you this morning that God wants to do the same thing in each of our lives. He's challenging us to put us in the places that are not our best comfort moments. It's not what we can control, it's what he has planned. And that's a big difference. When I can control everything, I'm in charge, and I know how that looks. But when God says, I want you to go over here, I'm not in control anymore. And it really bites some days because I really, really want to be in control. But I also know that if I let go and let God, the story changes. And I get to see things that I couldn't have imagined. I end with this. I have a... Um, over the last year, I've had the privilege of having a number of Redeemer students come on staff with me for eight months um, as interns. Two that just finished in September, um, who were working with us through church planting and learning everything about church planting. And I suspect one of those 20-year-old girls is gonna start the next church plant in Hamilton. Phenomenal, just seeing these gifts erupt in young people. Um, but the intern I have right now is in London. Um, and he's working with good news. Um, and I said to Isaac, you do know that you're kind of like the kid, the small kid behind you on a plane that keeps doing this to your seat? I said, you're going to irritate them to no end, but they're going to get to their destination. Um, Isaac just sees the world big, 
And so he goes outside of the church so he can see what's in the community because he's there to kind of be outreach and social prescriber and a few extra things in the community. And he discovers a tent city right behind the church. Um, and a couple of people from the church said, we didn't know there was a tent city there. And he goes, yep, and they have real names. So they now have a community breakfast every Friday morning for all the people who are living in that tent city who have no food, no electricity, and um, they're not always kind to one another. And uh, last Friday, there was at least 25 people who were there for breakfast while they're flipping pancakes and having a really good conversation. One of the Fridays that I dropped in to see how it was going, there was a man there uh, who's been homeless most of his adult life. This hand had a big cut in it that had stitches. And I said, what happened to your hand? And he turned it around, and the stitches were on this side. And during the night, he'd been attacked by a knife, and someone put that knife right through his hand. Had a couple more cuts up his arm. It's not safe on the street. Um, and he said, I didn't even know this church existed until you invited me in. And now he's there and has become a friend of Isaac's. Um, Isaac got to take him to the hospital to have the stitches taken out. And he said, as I saw his hand, I realized that's exactly the wound of our Savior. He said, it reminded me that he's a creation of Christ. And he bears a scar that says so. He said, I wanted to resent a little bit part of his story until I saw that scar and realized that Christ had called me to share friendship with this man. One of the others who is part of that was a chef at Western University, lost his job, can't afford apartment, now living in a tent. It's not just people who threw their lives away. Sometimes homelessness looks much bigger and sometimes the biggest population of homeless people is between 18 and 30, and maybe even younger. And if teenagers are on the street for more than six weeks, chances are they'll be on the street for the remainder of their life. It is a hard story for people on the street, and a lot of those kids just share one big apartment together, and they couch surf all over the place. So they're the unknown homeless. Sometimes we see the ones on the street, but we're missing another piece of that story. The widow, in some ways, was at that place of being the generational poverty moment, both as a widow and now with no food. And God sends a prophet to her. It's a crazy story because he asks for something rather than gives her something, but in the end, he gives her everything, and if you continue reading this chapter, you will know he also prays for her son when he dies and brings him back to life. God wants to do amazing things in your story. I'm excited every day when I get up about what is it for today that God wants to do in my life, but I also know it means I have to trust him. Maybe I'll give you one last story because this is the trust piece. Um, and I don't remember the last time that I was here, but over the last um, year and a half through COVID, 2020, October of 2020, my nephew at the age of 40 committed suicide. It was really tough, it was a shock. No one ever imagined that would happen. It didn't feel like part of his character and the story and we wonder, a part of it is that he had a brain tumor and there were some significant things that might have shown that. But the world was in chaos and no one was paying attention. And in the middle of grieving that story, he had three small girls. One of them was nine. Um, and six weeks after her father died, she got sick and they discovered ovarian cancer in a nine-year-old. They removed a five-pound tumor. They removed some body parts, and they repaired her bladder where this tumor was growing. 
She went through chemo and she went through radiation and she went through everything and lost her beautiful blonde locks. Um, and in March of 21, she rang the bell and we were all really, really excited. And then just a few months later, when she went back for her next checkup, they discovered a brain tumor. And they removed the brain tumor and they went through some more stuff and not long after, um, they discovered another one at the back of her brain that is inoperable. And so Thanksgiving of this past year, or just a few, you know, like in October, they didn't think she'd make it through October. Um, but she's still with us. And she's one feisty little kid in a wheelchair right now. But one of the things when I was praying for her I kept thinking of the stories in the Bible of Jesus healing little kids. And one of them is the moment where you say, um, little girl, arise, get up and have something to eat. And so throughout my day, I would be saying, Olivia, get up, go get something to eat. She couldn't hear me, but it was my prayer. And in Jesus' name, you know, God, show up. Um, and then I was in Orlando um, with a group of people from Resonate as we were meeting, and it's not unusual in the middle of the night for me to wake up and pray for her. And that night I woke up and I went to pray, and I physically could not pray anything. And I heard the whisper of God say, you can't pray that anymore, because you're more interested in the miracle than in trusting me. And he said, in the last two weeks, you've preached in churches about trusting God. Did you mean it? <laughs> I was like, shoot, you shouldn't say things from the front of a church because then you got to live it yourself. Anyway, God and I argued probably for about an hour about this trust thing. So I know it's not just a quick, yes, God, I trust you and we're going to get on. I still wanted the control of being able to say, Olivia, get up and get something to eat. I wanted to see her healed. And God said, you need to trust me in this story. And so after an hour, I said, fine. God, I will trust you in this story regardless of what it means. I called Barry in the morning, my husband who's sitting back there. And I said, so how did you sleep last night? And he said, I was up at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> I said, what? And he said, he told me exactly the same thing that God had told me. And we needed to change how we were praying. Um, so I thought, okay. So I called my sister and said, hey, this is what happened in the middle of the night. And she said, I've been fighting this for two days and I couldn't say the words, God, I trust you. But she said, now I can. And I called my aunt who's in her 80s who um, has been praying along this. And she said, I was at church on Sunday and they were singing I Surrender All. And she said, I couldn't sing it. And she said, now you're telling me I have to sing I Surrender All. And I said, yeah, yeah, I am. And the story has changed. And actually, the day after, uh, they removed the shunt. Um, they had a drain in her brain to drain the fluid. And they were putting a shunt in. And so for the few weeks before, probably three weeks, she hadn't had any verbal communication. She could not speak. It was gone because of where this brain tumor was. And on Tuesday, when she woke up from the operation, she said, I'm hungry, I want an apple fritter. And I got thinking about, have something to eat. But when I quit, and God said, trust me. And the nurse said, well, you haven't eaten. You had a feeding tube. I don't know, we can give you an apple fritter. Do you want water? And she said, I didn't say I was thirsty. I said I was hungry. She's cheeky. Um, she ate her apple fritter that night. And every day we see how this journey unfolds, but we live it one day at a time because we don't know. And so every morning we have to say, God, I trust you for this story. I trust you for what you're going to do. But I know it's the same trust that we need as congregations that Jesus wants to do something amazing in our lives and with those around us. But our heart's cry will have to be, God, I trust you. 
and I'm willing to give even if it costs me something. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to unpack and share a story that you gave to us. Because God, I find in your stories there's so much about our own lives if we pay attention. And God, I know that there are moments in the middle of our journey right now through COVID and who knows what else and just the unrest around the world that it would be easy to just have a meal and give up. And then you put someone in our lives who says, we still need you. There's a reminder from you that you have a bigger plan and that you want to sustain and grow and do incredible things. And God, today, I pray that you would share that vision and heart, that your Holy Spirit would unleash in each of us the courage to say, God, I trust you, even when it makes no sense. And God, thank you for what you have planned. Thank you for your story, for our lives. And thank you, God, that you decided it was worthy to place us here in 2022 because you called us with the gifts and you created us to be your hands and feet in our world and in our community. God, help us to be faithful and help us to be reminded every day that it is worth trusting you, that it's worth serving you, and it's worth looking outside of our comfort zones to see where you're already providing provision. God, do great things for our very eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. with us in body and spirit.
Right now, there is going to be, during the offering, a video, and uh, those of you who are at the potluck will recognize yourself. So enjoy. Uh, Pavel um, made this for us as a gift, and uh, uh, it, it was really a celebration that evening of community, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Shall we pray? Merciful God, the gifts we bring are so small in comparison to the vast needs in our world. Nowhere near enough to save the thousands dying of starvation all around the world, or even to meet the needs of the hungry and homeless in our city. Yet we have brought what we can. As you once multiplied the five small loaves and two fish, multiply these gifts as well, so that once again the hungry may receive all they need and more. Amen. Sending God. Never let us think the call to share the good news of Jesus is for a select few. You send us along with the whole church to all people with the gospel. May our obedience as messengers of the gospel be refreshing to you, like a cool drink on a sweltering summer day. 
To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.